you put down path signals at all the entrances to your intersection, and you put block signals at all the exits to your intersection. Hello everyone, Toaster here, your third most favorite kitchen appliance. And if it wasn't before, it is now. Welcome to the first part of the Ultimate Beginner's Train Guide for Satisfactory, or as I like to call it, the game of half-finished projects. You love them, you hate them, maybe you never even considered using them, but trains and Satisfactory are an awesome way to transport materials around your world. It may not be the most efficient way, but once you get your rail network up and running, man does it look cool. And building a rail network can also really tie your whole world together, bringing a very unique and organic network to a very grid-like and artificial factory. Now, after investing over 700 hours into my world, whose entire foundation and functionality is based off of trains, and after update 5, which completely ruined everything, I've had to put in over 200 of those hours rebuilding my rail system, and implementing a complex railroad network, because long gone are the days where trains incorporated quantum physics and could go through each other. No. Now, all of a sudden, they have to be realistic, and slam into each other, and derail, and cause traffic, and give me headaches. But... After spending so much time rebuilding my rail network, I can confidently say that I have learned a lot about how trains function in Satisfactory. And I understand that the newly added collision system, in combination with the dreaded rail signals, can be a bit off-putting to players who've never used trains before. But not to worry, because I'm here to pass on my knowledge to my fellow Fixit employees. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a handful of barrel nuts, pull your lizard doggo in close, And without further ado, let's get the first most important thing out of the way. And it's the one main reason that I could probably guess why you're here. The one thing that has prevented your rail network from functioning properly. The one thing that has you confused, angry, struggling. It's of course, the dreaded path signal. You stand there trying to figure out the logic of these complicated signals, but you just don't know what to do. Well, not anymore, because this is the secret you've been searching for this whole time. Your complex intersections. Path signals at all of the entrances to your intersections and block signals at all of the exits to your intersection. There. That's it. That's the secret. If there's one thing to take away from this guide, it's that. I guarantee you that this will solve 95% of your problems. Now, I open with that as I feel that it's one of the most common issues with trains satisfactory, especially in regards to path signals, since they're not very well explained in-game and there are no real tutorials. So I wanted to get that out of the way first, but we'll go further in depth into that in another video in this series. First, we'll be starting off with the most basic concepts of trains, which is intended for new players. So if you're good with the bare basics, then check out the bookmarks in this video and skip ahead to your desired section. Or you can go ahead and skip to one of the next videos in the series. If you're new and you need a complete crash course on trains, then stick around because we're going to go ahead and tackle the complete basics. Trains and all necessary components to create a rail network are unlocked at Tier 6 at the hub. This includes stations, freight platforms, rails, trains, freight cars, and signals. You can find all the related train buildables you need under the transport tab of the builder menu. All the resources you need to construct a rail network include concrete, cables, copper sheets, pipes, steel memes, motors, heavy modular frames, circuit boards, and computers. Not too bad in the grand scheme of things. First up, we have our rails. Rails use one pipe and one steel meme to construct a short section of rail, which increases in cost the further you drag it out. Rails use these resources sparingly, making it very cheap to span rails far distances across your map. Rails can be placed anywhere in the world, and on all foundations and some architecture pieces, such as frames, roofs, pillars, and even catwalks. There are some limitations to what you can do with rails. You can't make a rail track too short. The single shortest rail segment you can make is one and a half foundations long. You can't make a rail track too long. The longest you can make a single segment of rail is 12 and a half foundations long. Rails can't go at too steep of an angle, and rail can't make turns that are too sharp. You can clip rails through the world, water, and through buildables. Trains will travel through them, no problem. Also take note of this, avoid placing rails too close together. I'll go over this later on in the video, but just trust me on this for now. You can power your rail network by connecting a single train station to your power grid. Now, rails carry electricity through them, so what's awesome about this is that by powering a single station, you can essentially power any and all stations and freight platforms that are connected by rails in your rail network. Meaning that you do not have to power every single station individually, and you can avoid dragging a complicated and ugly mess of cables and power poles across the map. So, as long as you power one station, and everything in your rail network is completely connected by rails, then you power everything in that rail network.
What's even cooler is that you can then go to a completely separate station from the one you initially powered, and you could go ahead and drag a cable from it and connect that to a factory. And as you'll see, it will now power that factory. Since that station is being powered from your rail network now, which in turn is drawing power from your electrical grid, that station can then extend your power grid and power anything that you connect it to. This is great, as you can use a rail network as a means to extend your power grid to your remote factories seamlessly and without dragging ugly power poles and cables across the map. This is another reason why you should consider setting up a rail network even if you're just using it as a taxi service. Also, rails carry electricity through them by proximity, meaning if you have a hover pack and you're nearby a powered rail, your hover pack will be able to draw electricity from it, which is useful for hovering around short distances or can be used when you're expanding your rail network so you can hover above the map and get a bird's eye view of what you're building. This makes it much easier to place down rails and, again, can be done without dragging power lines across the map. The power requirements for your rail network are as follows. Train stations use 50 megawatts of power at all times. Freight platforms require 50 megawatts each, but only when loading or unloading goods. Otherwise, they use a whopping 0.1 megawatts of power when they're on standby. Lastly, a locomotive will draw a range of power between 25 megawatts up to a max of 110 megawatts. The locomotive will always draw a minimum of 25 megawatts of power at all times, even when it's stopped, and that will only increase when a locomotive is accelerating. The more effort it takes for that locomotive to accelerate, the more power it will draw up to the maximum of 110 megawatts. This can be impacted by the number of freight cars you have attached in a single train line, or if your train is attempting to go up a steep incline. In both instances, your locomotive will have to exert more effort and thus draw more power to accelerate. Braking does not influence power draw and neither does speed. When a train is cruising at high speeds and is not actively accelerating, it will use less power. So speed and braking does not play a factor in how much power a locomotive will draw, only acceleration does. Since the maximum power draw for a locomotive is 110 megawatts, that means that you should always have at least 110 megawatts of power reserved in your power grid, for a single locomotive. Now if you have multiple locomotives in a single train line, then their power consumption gets added together, meaning that if you have three locomotives in a train line, the power consumption will be tripled, and now the new power draw for that train line will range from a minimum of 75 megawatts to a maximum of 330 megawatts. The more train stations and train lines you have on your rail network, the more power demanding it's going to get, and that can spike very quickly if you're not too careful. The speed for a locomotive is of course 0 km per hour at a dead stop, and can accelerate to a speed of about 120 km per hour on average on a flat surface. According to the wiki, it states that apparently you could get a train to reach up to 500 km per hour going downhill on a steep incline in perfect conditions. Now that's insane. I've never seen it happen in my world. In my rail network, I usually see around maybe 160 km per hour to maybe 180 km per hour. Uh, going downhill on steep inclines, so you could probably expect that too. Also, you can't set the speed at which a locomotive will travel, and a locomotive will always attempt to accelerate to the max speed. Locomotives carry momentum, so the faster a train is going, the longer it's going to take for it to stop. And this, of course, will be impacted based on whether the train line is going up or down a hill, and how many locomotives and freight cars are in your train line. The more cars in a train line, the longer it will take for it to stop. Locomotives must be placed on rails. They cannot be freely placed out into the world. After placing a locomotive on a rail, you can then attach additional locomotives or freight cars to it. They will snap together automatically to create a single entity. You can no longer delete a segment of rail that a train is on. The train must be removed or deleted first before you can delete that segment of rail. Also, you can't delete trains or freight cars when they're moving. You have to wait for them to stop moving first. If your locomotive or freight car is gingerly sliding down an incline, then again, you have to wait for it to stop before the game will let you delete it. At the moment, train lights will always stay on. They can't be turned off. Also, we cannot hurt you. Uh, um, <coughs> I mean, trains cannot hurt you. If they hit you, they'll either push you out of the way or they'll go right over you, forcing you to go underneath us. I mean them. You can hop into a locomotive by pressing E on it, and you can manually drive it around. You can access a freight car by pressing E on it, and you can manually load and unload resources. You can have fun with this in the meantime before we get into automation. In order to automate a rail network, you'll need at least two train stations. Note that when placing a train station, it is directional, one way only. 
Whichever way the arrow faces is the way that a train must travel. And it's also the direction that a train will attempt to enter the station. So keep that in mind. If you have the station facing the wrong way, then the train will refuse to travel there, even if there's a clear path for it. Now there's one method where this does not apply, which is regarding the push-pull method, which I'll discuss in a later video. There are two types of functional platforms and two types of decorative platforms. The freight platform, which is used for loading and unloading your dry goods, and the fluid freight fluid blah, 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 blah. and the fluid freight platform, which is used for the loading and unloading of your fluids. This includes both liquids like water and sulfuric acid and gases like nitrogen. Both freight and fluid freight platforms have two resource inputs and two resource outputs each, meaning that with a tier five conveyor belt, you can shovel in or out up to 1,560 resources per minute. And with a fluid freight platform and a tier two pipe, you can push in or out up to 1,200 meters cubed of fluid per minute. A freight platform can hold up to 48 stacks of dry goods, and the fluid freight platform can hold up to 2,400 meters cubed of fluid. Both freight platforms can be placed down with the inputs and outputs side facing whichever way suits the needs of your factory. Flipping the direction of the freight platform can be accomplished by scrolling the mouse wheel. The decorative platforms can be used to fill in the gaps between your freight platforms or extend the length of your station in order to fit in longer train lines with tail and locomotives, or just to beautify your factory. A freight or decorative platform cannot be placed down unless it's being attached to a train station, or unless it's attached to another platform that's connected to a train station. You can place a train station down, then a freight or decorative platform, and then delete the train station. The freight or decorative platform will remain there, and you could go ahead and connect additional platforms or rails to it. I don't know why you want to do this unless you're troubleshooting a problem or relocating the train station. Just keep in mind that deleting a train station and rebuilding it will completely reset it, even if you reattach it to the old existing freight platforms, meaning that you'll have to manually rename it, and any trains that you program to stop at that station will have to be reprogrammed as well. Now, you may have heard me refer to a train line. A train line is a word that I just made, but it's just any combination of locomotives and freight cars that will move and act as a single entity. The locomotive that is facing in the proper direction and that is at the front of your train line will be the lead train. The lead locomotive will always be the part of your train line that will stop at a train station, regardless of how many locomotives are in your train line. Additional locomotives can be added to your train line. It won't increase its speed, but it will help with acceleration, including helping your train line fight steep inclines. This is especially useful in train lines that are extremely long, but again, the more locomotives you add to a train line, the more power they'll require. Now, a few things to note. Automated trains can't go in reverse, but you can have trains facing opposite directions at the opposite ends of your train line. This is part of the push-pull method, which I'll go over in a later video. Automated trains can't have locomotives facing inwards towards each other. They will give off an error saying unable to reach the next station. This also goes if you're trying to get creative by placing freight cars in front of a locomotive. This won't work either for the same reason. You can still manually drive them this way, you just can't automate them. A single freight car can carry either a combination of dry goods or a single type of fluid, but not both at the same time. It's important to note that dry goods can only be loaded and unloaded at a freight platform and fluids at a fluid freight platform. By this I mean you can't load a fluid from a fluid freight platform onto a freight car and then try to unload it at a dry goods freight platform. For obvious reasons, it won't work. A freight car doesn't need to be programmed to take a certain resource. It will be done automatically depending on which freight platform it's stopped at. A single freight car can carry up to either a combination of 32 stacks of any dry good or up to 1600 meters cubed of a single type of fluid, which is significantly less than what your freight stations can hold. Fluids cannot be mixed for obvious reasons, but dry goods can. Most people generally don't mix dry goods in a single freight car as it tends to complicate things, so it's generally safer to use separate freight cars for different resources. But it is possible to do so, and perhaps it could be beneficial to your specific situation, such as if you're producing very small quantities of resources, or if you're producing resources uniformly in a one-to-one -one ratio. When you place down a freight platform, you must set that platform to either load or unload the resources from a freight car which will depend on your needs. To do this, you have to approach that platform, select the default key E to enter its configuration menu, and at the bottom left under train settings, there will be a toggle switch to set that platform to either unload or load resources. 
go ahead and set that toggle switch to your desired position. Keep in mind that by default, it will be set to load. So if you need the resource to unload at a specific platform, then make sure that you go ahead into that menu and hit that toggle switch. Regardless of whether I need a resource to load or unload, I like to double check every time I put down a freight platform, just for peace of mind. If you programmed a train line to go to a station to load or unload resources, then when that train line reaches that station, it will start the docking process automatically. All freight cars and that train line that have stopped at a freight platform will dock and they will load or unload their respective resource. The docking animation takes precisely 27.08 seconds to complete. When your train is docking, both the freight car and the freight platform will become unaccessible. Also, unlike truck stations, when a freight platform is undergoing the docking animation, it will stop spinning out resources from the freight platform until the animation has completed. Keep that in mind if you're an efficiency nut, because you'll have to calculate that 27.08 seconds of delayed resources into your equation, if that's important to you. In order to automate a train line, your rail system must, of course, have at least two stations, both connected to each other in a closed loop, excluding the push-pull method, and must also be powered. Simply go up to a train station and hit the default key E to open up the configuration menu. The first thing you'll see in this menu is the power usage stats of your power grid, and you can set the name of the train station that you currently have selected. From there, up top, you'll see the timetable tab. Hit that and it will bring you to the timetable menu. From there, you'll see a list of all the trains on your network and a map strictly showing the locations of your trains and train stations in real time. From this menu, you can configure all the trains that are connected to the same rail network that your station is connected to. If you have two separate networks that aren't connected to each other by a railway, then the trains and stations on that separate network won't show up. If you use a rail to connect these two separate networks, then it will combine them into one network, making all trains and stations from both networks available on this list. Also, a rail does not have to be physically connected to another rail in order to combine a network. They can simply touch or cross over one another, and it will combine those separate networks just the same. Now go ahead and select the train that you like to automate. It will bring up a new menu. From here, you can name the selected train, and you also have two options edit timetable, and turn on or off self-driving. We want to automate our train, so go ahead and turn on self-driving. The train won't do anything yet, not until your program is timetable. It'll just yell at you and tell you that there's no timetable yet. So let's go ahead and fix that. The timetable is where we set the destinations for the train. So select that tab and it will bring you to yet another menu. On the left, you have available stations, which are all the train stations that are attached to the current network. And on the right, you have the current timetable for your train, which is all the destination stations that you have selected which should be empty at the moment. So go ahead and select at least two stations from the left side. Hover over them and hit the plus tab that shows up. This will add those stations to the current timetable for your currently selected train. Once you've selected the desired stations, you can change the order of them by dragging them around. Trains will travel from one station to the next in order from top to bottom. So ideally, it's beneficial for you to pick the most efficient and direct route for your train. One of the most important pieces of information to keep in the back of your mind at all times is that a train will travel from one station to the next in the absolute shortest distance possible. It's not going to take the fastest path or the least used path or the path that has the least amount of traffic. No, it's always going to take the shortest possible distance between stations. When you hover over a station, you can see where it is on the map on the right, which is useful for determining the order of travel you want to set for the currently selected train and the timetable. Also, you can hover over the stations at the timetable for the selected train and you'll see two options, an X and a cogwheel. The X does exactly what you think it does. It removes the station from the current timetable, meaning your train won't stop there anymore. The cogwheel has some advanced features which could perchance interest you. If you're not interested in them, then be sure to save your changes before closing the menu. Changes won't take effect until you save and close the menu. When you close the timetable menu and you made sure to turn self-driving on, then your train will head off to its next station and it will continue to follow its timetable indefinitely until either it crashes, gets stuck somewhere due to traffic, or you manually stop it by turning off self-driving. But congratulations, give yourself a pat on the back because you now have an automated train. But now, going back to the more advanced features, selecting the cogwheel opens another more advanced menu where you can specify many things. The first option you'll see is a drop-down menu where you can specify whether a train should stay at a station until one load unload cycle has been completed, or until the freight car has been fully loaded or unloaded. Pretty self-explanatory, but it's basically saying that the train will stay docked at the station until a single load or unload cycle has been completed, or it will stay at the station for as long as it needs to and complete as many load or unload cycles it can until the freight car is either completely empty or until it's completely filled. Next, you'll see the word OR in a small box. 
followed by the words wait for seconds with the number 15 in a small box or it can be toggled to end and you can change the 15 seconds to whatever time you want. By changing this, you can make the train stop at this specific station in regards to the previous setting and have it wait additional time if desired. For example, by default, a train will arrive at this specified station and it will attempt to complete one load or unload cycle. If it can, great. If it can't load or unload, then it will wait at the station for 15 seconds and then move on to the next stop. But we can reduce this time to zero seconds so that if none of the freight cars in the train line can complete a load or unload cycle, we can force the train to scurry off into the sunset immediately instead of letting it sit around for 15 seconds and burn precious daylight. Hey, you are a fixed employee after all, and remember, you're contractually obligated to be as efficient as possible. Below that, you'll see two boxes with add item tabs at the bottom of each. One says load only, and the other says unload only. Here's where you can specify what resources your train line should load or unload at a specific station. By default, freight cars and train line that stop at a freight platform will automatically load or unload all resources. By specifying the items in this menu, we can load and unload only those selected resources across all freight cars and a train line. even if they're mixed with another resource in a single freight car. So again, it's a situational feature, but it can be useful. Also note that the freight platform at the destination station must match your settings in order for this advanced feature to work. And by this, I mean that if you program a train to stop at a station and want it to unload concrete only, then the freight platform at that station must have its toggle switch set to unload. If it's not, then this advanced feature will not work. These are the more advanced features you can use to nail down your efficiency of your factory. I usually leave everything on their default setting, but feel free to mess around with these settings. And again, be sure to save before closing this menu. The settings won't take effect until you do so. If you hop into a locomotive, you can press the default key Q to open up a very familiar menu. Unlike the train station, you can only program the train that you just jumped in, but from here you can set up its timetable, its advanced features, and most importantly, you can toggle its self-driving feature. This is useful when trains crash, and you have to rerail them, because when that happens, their self-driving feature will automatically be turned off and you'll have to manually turn it back on. Using this menu is a much more convenient method to re-rail and re-automate your trains on the spot rather than having to hunt down the nearest train station, which can be inconvenient and timely. This is also useful as you can use a train as an on-the-spot taxi service. Another important thing you should know is that timetables and programming are not just embedded in the lead locomotive of your train line, rather they are embedded across an entire train line, meaning that if you accidentally delete the lead locomotive in a train line, then you can simply reattach a new locomotive. And if you hop into it and open up the timetable menu, you'll see that your old timetable is still available. Fully deleting an entire train line will wipe it from the timetable menu and permanently delete the programming that you set for that train line. Also, in a related matter, unlike the train lines, deleting a train station and rebuilding it will completely reset it, even if you reattach it to the old existing freight platforms, meaning that you'll manually have to rename it and any trains that you program to stop at that station will have to be reprogrammed as well. By now, you know how to automate your trains, set up timetables, and be familiar with the advanced train menus, but let's briefly talk about manually operating trains. You can hop into a locomotive by going up to it and pressing E. By hopping into a locomotive, you can manually operate it. All the directions will be listed at the bottom of the screen by default, but you use W and S to move forward or backwards, D and A will make the train go left or right when you're approaching an intersection. And note, you don't have to hold down D or A to go left or right, you only have to tap it once. Spaces break, and Q opens up the train menu, and E is exit. Also, by pressing left click on your mouse, you can make the train go choo-choo, which is perhaps one of the best features in the game. Now, if you're operating a train line with freight cars and you want to load or unload resources at a station, then all you have to do is drive the train into that station, line it up as best as you can, 
and then you should see on your screen, press F to dock. Now you can load or unload your resources manually at your train stations. Also, if you think that mistakes were made, you can press Q to open up the train menu, and you'll have the option to cancel docking. The cancel docking feature is also available for your automated trains as well, which can be accessed directly in the Q menu of the train you enter, or available globally for any train line by directly accessing that train through a train station. Now, it won't cancel the animation, but it will prevent resources from being transferred. And there will also be a funny visible glitch where you'll have a freight car whose freight container is missing or is visible when it shouldn't be. Also important to note that when trains are automated, you can't manually control them. So if you'd like to take control of an automated train, you'd have to hop into that train. Then you'll have to open up the train menu and then turn off self-driving. Then you can manually take control of the train. In order to get your rail system fully up and running, we'll need to take a quick crash course on the block signal. The block signal is the simpler of the two rail signals in Satisfactory. It's also the easiest to use, understand, and is a must-use feature on any rail network that's operating multiple trains. Basically, rails in your rail network can be divided into blocks using a block signal. A block signal can only be placed at the ends of your rail segments, not in the middle of them. The devs color-coded the blocks, and they become visible when you whip out a signal from the build menu which makes it super easy to see. Thank you, devs. When you place down a block signal, it will automatically split your rail into different blocks, and you can visually see this because the colors of the blocks will change in real time. When a train occupies a block, it won't let any other trains enter that block. Not until the occupying train leaves it. Utilizing block signals is how you're going to manage your traffic and prevent collisions on your rail network. Also note that block signals are directional, like trains, so they must face the same way that your intended traffic is going. We'll go further in depth into signals in the next video, so check that out, but this should give you enough info to get your rail network up and running. Here are some tips for setting up block signals to get your network up and running. First, remember when earlier in the video I mentioned to avoid building rails too close together? This is why. Block signals don't just affect the rail that they're attached to. They also affect any rail that is touching it or that is in close enough proximity to it. Meaning that if you build your rails too close together, not only can it cause collisions with the other trains, but they can also be accidentally programmed into a nearby block signal when you never intended for it to do that. So keep that in mind when building your network. For block signal placement, place block signals both at the beginnings and at the ends of your train stations. This will prevent other trains from trying to enter a station that's already occupied by a train. Next up, place block signals at all the entrances and at all of the exits to your intersections. This will prevent trains from crashing into each other when they try to enter an intersection. If you want to get super fancy and jump ahead of the curve and incorporate path signals into your intersections, then go ahead and return to that caveat at the beginning of the video. Path signals at all your entrances and block signals at all the exits to your intersection. Also, I'd recommend frequently placing block signals along a rail network to help keep your traffic moving. That's all you need to know about block signals for now. It's honestly as simple as that. Now that you're building large rail networks where you probably have included intersections in them and have multiple trains operating on them, you're likely to encounter collisions, traffic, and situations where your trains are stopped in the tracks and taunt you with warning lights for reasons that you don't understand. There are two types of collisions. Low-speed collisions where trains will not derail and will just tap into each other. Go! Touch and high-speed collisions where trains that are going too fast will slam into each other and completely derail. Trains will only derail by colliding into each other, so you can have trains making all sorts of sharp turns at insane speeds and they'll stay on tracks perfectly fine. Also, when trains derail, they lose their hitboxes, just like the good old days. Low-speed collisions won't derail a train, but will prevent the train from moving any further. And if traffic is completely stopped for one reason or another, it will cause a warning signal to happen, which will be indicated by the yellow flashing warning triangles on the map. High-speed collisions resulting in a derail will be indicated by an audio cue and a notification popping up on the left side of the screen. stating the names of the two train lines that have collided into each other. This will also be indicated by red flashing warning triangles on the map. In order to rerail a train and get it operational again, you just have to go up to it, it will give you a prompt to press E to rerail the train, and it will rerail that train to the closest and safest position on the rail where the collision occurred. In some scenarios where the train has disappeared from your map, maybe it fell into an abyss or something, you may see the ghost of the train, which you can go up to and you'll be given the same prompt to rerail the train. 
Now you can hop into that train, press Q to open up the train menu, and from here, you can turn self-driving back on. All the other settings in your timetable would have been preserved, so you don't have to reprogram your train. You just need to turn the self-driving mode back on, and the train will continue on its merrily little way, just as it was before it was derailed. You'd also want to go ahead and troubleshoot the problem, and make the necessary adjustments to your rail network so that this collision doesn't happen again. Some other scenarios you might face are trains that are just stopped and won't be able to reach their destination. Sometimes it can be due to silly mistakes and overstates, like you place a block signal or pass signal down facing the wrong direction, perhaps a train station facing the wrong direction, or you forgot to lay down a segment of rail somewhere. But largely, you'll face the issue of train stop due to gridlock traffic. This can be caused if you have train lines that are too long, rail segments that are too short, intersections that are too close together, or intersections that are too complex, all of which can cause a myriad of problems, including traffic and gridlock. Another thing that could happen is that even if a train were to derail and has been completely knocked off the track, other trains will still stop and wait until the derail train has been re-railed and then moved out of the way. We'll go over methods to solve these problems in another video, so make sure to look out for that. But for now, just be sure to check your map every once in a while and look out for the yellow flashing warning lights signaling that your trains are gridlocked. In the meantime, you can try and troubleshoot the problem yourself, or as a temporary fix, you can just hop in them, open the train menu by hitting Q, turn autopilot off, and manually move them out of the way. And then turn your autopilot back on. Works in a pinch. But your problem will inevitably happen again until the necessary changes are made. But with that, you'll know and understand the basics of trains in Satisfactory, and you'll be able to set up and successfully automate your rail network. This is Satisfactory, so you can build as many rail networks and as many different rail systems as you want in any crazy or complex way that you could think of. So have at it. For further in-depth videos on train logic, path signals, building strategies, and troubleshooting tips, be sure to look out for the next video on this guide, which I will be releasing soon if it's not already out. And that's the complete basics for trains and the first part of this guide. I originally intended to just make one video explaining everything, but there was just way too much information to fit in one video. So now I'm going to split it up into multiple parts. This is my first guide and my first officially fully edited video. I had no idea how demanding it was to make a video like this, but I had a lot of fun doing it. Not only do I have to finish the other parts of this guide, but I will also be making more satisfactory guides, more video game guides, and more video game content in general in the future. Thank you so much for watching. If this video helped you out, then be sure to like and subscribe. Also check out my account on Rumble. I post the same content over there as well. You can find a link for it in the description below. Thanks again. I've been Toaster. Peace out.